what has transpired already. So when I wrote this, I was trying to come up with something that would be of some interest, and I hope some crossover between the various areas. So I decided to talk about the various results that we've had using pairing wave functions in Quantum Monte Carlo for uh, a variety of uh, systems. Well, maybe for um, nuclear physics, for uh, electronic structure, a little bit. This is work that Mikhail did, and uh, uh, for some cold atom research. And I wanted to end with talking about going beyond pairing with some work that I've been working on, on looking at three and four body clustering. OK. Uh, because of there, I'm looking at all these various ways, I thought I would just uh, indicate, is this a pointer? I can, ah, uh, yes. Which the button? Yellow, the yellow. The yellow. I've been known to turn off the projector if we're using these. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so. Uh, oh, a stick might be better. That, uh, then I won't turn off the projector with this. I might <laughs> knock down the screen. but. Uh, OK, so I wanted to just, just talk about the, uh, an overview of the of Diffusion Monte Carlo that we use. And this is a way to think about Diffusion Monte Carlo that works for all the different methods that I will talk about. And so since most people know Diffusion Monte Carlo somehow, this is the auxiliary field formalism, but it's Diffusion Monte Carlo. And so you can see what we always want is here we have walkers, and these are just positions. And we want them sampled from this, that is the wave function in imaginary time multiplied by the trial function for the important sample and sampling. So this is what we would sample in Diffusion Monte Carlo. Here's the propagator in imaginary time with the, I've done the trotter break up here. And then, because this is a, a square of an operator, we can just use the hubbard stratonovich transformation. So that's what I've written is this p squared is just this integral over a Gaussian with uh, this linearized operator here. So this is what the hubbard stratonovich transformation always does, is it linearizes uh, these quadratic operators. And you can see then that, of course, in this case of the momentum and many other operators, you can write many kinds of translation operators or transition operators in this kind of form. So in fact, it looks then like a Fourier transform of, in this case, a Gaussian. But if you want something else, for example, if you wanted a relativistic kinetic energy, you can just change this kernel here to, for example, modified Bessel function will change it into square root p squared plus m squared and various other things. But by writing it in this form, then we have this, which is just the translation operator, so that it takes you from your walker, if you're at a, at a position r, you hit it with the translation operator, and that moves you to the new place. So there's nothing new here. This is just the standard diffusion Monte Carlo written in perhaps a slightly odd way, but it makes it like the standard uh, hubbard stratonovich auxiliary form field formalism. And then if you want to propagate with important sampling, then you start with your walker here. Because it's sampled from this, you need to divide by that weight. And because you want the new one sampled from this, you need to multiply by the wave function at the new position. So this is just the translated, that's just this thing translated position, and this is the translated walker. And there's our kernel. Then you look at this, and you can see that the only thing that depends on, on this capital X auxiliary field variable is this part, so that if you then just complete the square in the usual way, taking into account that these, you can expand this 
and then you get the expectation values of the linear term and the quadratic terms here. This then just becomes the usual diffusion Monte Carlo, drifted Gaussian, where PL is the, the local uh, value, that is ex the expectation well, the mixed expectation between R and psi t of the momentum operator, which is up to a factor of i is just the gradient. And so this is your usual drifted Gaussian. And if you carry the other terms together, you get the local energy weight. And then you see that this is then just standard diffusion Monte Carlo. We sample from this drifted Gaussian. We have a local energy weight. And this is the new position. Here. So the composition is Ah, uh, OK. I, there we go. I sample this x, which is the auxiliary field, has nothing to do yet with the, with the new position. So I sample this from this drifted Gaussian. Having that, oh, look, the new position is given by this translation here. So it's exactly what you would do. You know, your computer code says sample x from this. Now that you have an x, that tells you what the new position is. So it's exactly the same thing. The reason I wanted to do this is because then if we do any other Hamiltonian that we can write as the sum of squares, like when we do nuclear physics, the spin parts of the Hamiltonian can be written as sum of squares. It's all done exactly this way. So. In that case, there'll be new auxiliary fields for, and these will be spin operators. We do the drifted Gaussian, everything goes through. So that what I'm trying to say is if you look at diffusion Monte Carlo this way, it's all one. And then I don't have to talk about it anymore. Because everyone can sit down and do this for a nuclear physics problem with auxiliary field diffusion Monte Carlo exactly this way, or uh, in any other auxiliary field. So if you go on the lattice you can, and want to do diffusion Monte Carlo, you can do it this way. Kevin, yes. Does it really make sense to treat the kinetic energy this way? This is how we treat it. This is how you do it. You see, because you, you introduce complex numbers, complex numbers. No, well, this doesn't, because this so is real. The Gaussian. the Gaussian is real here. When we do. This? No, 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 no. no. Ah, yes, but P has an I too, so it's the usual drift. This is, this is, this is, this P local is the gradient. It's, it's basically minus I, the gradient of the trial function. So those cancel. Okay, so this is, and in fact, I mean, uh, you know, I'm being as usual sloppy, but you must for the momentum, because it's an unbounded operator, you must take this x to be real. But then, if you calculate the gradient, why not go to this Fourier transform? If you but it's, that's, what it, uh, that's, of course, the standard way to so do it. It's much easier than, than sampling. You can see the exact thing. Well, you see, uh, when you apply the kinetic energy, you can do Fourier transform, apply p, which is diagonally momentum space, and then back Fourier transform. Yeah, but I can't Fourier transform my in many the gradient, dimensions. Yes. So, so that's it's the gradient of the trial function, though. It's not the gradient of the, I mean, the walkers are just these positions. Is there some, is there, it's not, I, anyway, this, all I was trying to do, the point here was try to make diffusion Monte Carlo in the auxiliary field formalism so that I didn't have to talk about the auxiliary field formalism for the other problems that, but the, they go, the only thing that's a little different here, which because you brought up the eyes, this x here must be real because p is an unbounded operator. So if you made x complex, then this would be a disaster. So for diffusion Monte Carlo, this must be this. If you go on to a lattice or any other thing that makes you into a compact space, then you can bound these operators and you can then, if you like, move this 
integral off into the complex plane. But that's, you know, mathematically up to you. I'm still a little confused. Okay, so I understand the PL yeah. that just acts on the traveling function. Right. What about the P on the right hand side? This one? Yeah. That acts on the, uh, that's an operator. This is an operator. All of these are numbers. Yeah. So once you tell me the initial walker position, I know what the trial function is, I can calculate all of this. Right. Okay, so that's the standard. This is just the usual translation operator. So it just says, if you operate this on R, you get a new walker at a new position. Okay, so it's it's exactly the fusion Monte Carlo written in the way that we want to write uh, for so what I was trying to avoid, but if you if you have a, a an operator like this, a potential like this, so this would be a typical kind of term that you would have in the nuclear Hamiltonian. This guy, you could write, well, there's various, there's a bunch of ways you could write it. But if you wrote it, for example, minus, like that with probably a quarter, this is So I've then written this, this operator as a sum of squares. I can then do exactly this same thing here. And I will have then operating on things like this. Well, there will be a V delta T. There will be a thing like that that I will have. In which case, if I have a walker that has positions in spinners, then this is essentially a rotation on the spinners. And I can do important sampling exactly the same way. So the, the point of this is that all of this fits together in exactly the same way. And if you have a, you know, if you have a, whatever, V, I, J, K, L, A dagger, I, A, dagger J A K A L, this kind of thing. You can write this as a sum of squares of operators that are like those with coefficients here and do the same thing. So the point is it's all one, one thing. So this is what I was saying. So for all the Hamiltonians I want to talk about, we can write the Hamiltonian as the sum of squares of operators. You can also, because, you know, because it looks like a Fourier transform here, as I said, basically any, it doesn't have to be squares. It's anything that you can Fourier transform the exponential of. It's just the square it happens to be a Gaussian, so it makes it nice. So all the ones I'll talk about are sum of squares. So we choose the Walker basis such that this translation operator operating on a Walker gives a new Walker, gives one new Walker, and then possibly multiplied by a weight. So once you've figured out how you break it up and it you have to pick your walkers and your breakup so that they make sense. So by using the positions for diffusion Monte Carlo, then our breakup gives us this translation operator, which has a, takes you from one walker to another. And we do the same thing in this formalism here. So for neutron matter, the walkers are the positions, as in diffusion Monte Carlo, along with a spinner for each particle, so that we can do this kind of stuff. Okay. For lattice Hamiltonians, the walkers are sets of orbitals, one for each particle, and then we can operate with these kind of operators. So then important sampling, drift, local energy are derived, etc. 
exactly as in Diffusion Monte Carlo. So everything else just goes through. So, yeah. Okay. Are you going to talk a little bit about how you're going to combine them so that the coefficients are positive? No. The coefficients aren't necessarily positive, and that leads to a sign problem. The only, so there's a sign problem in diffusion Monte Carlo, which is often dealt with with fixed node. There's a sign or phase problem in the auxiliary field diffusion Monte Carlo with this, which is dealt with approximately and less in a worse approximation in the sense that it's not controlled as well. The fixed node's an upper bound. Whereas the approximations that we use in nuclear physics are not upper bounds. They are variational in the looser sense of being quadratic, so in the Schwinger sense. Uh, so that's not dealt with as well. And the only lattice ones I'll show are the unitary gas and those don't because the interaction is always negative on these lattice sites it's it doesn't have a sign problem so okay okay i think i'll just everybody knows so this is just to talk about cold atoms cold atoms can can be superfluid here's the Bose condensate, probably, but here's the more real proof that you get of vortices. So, and then nu neutron matter becomes superfluid. See, so San I stole Sanjay's uh, picture. What's that? The finger credit goes to Danny. Oh, well, your name was uh, there, so I. <laughs> anyway. Yes, well, you know, I just wanted to, it's pretty, you know. <laughs> there are old things, you know, like paintings. Some of them are old and still pretty. Physics hasn't changed. <laughs> I hope. Anyway. Okay. So this is the standard Slater determinant that, and it can be written as a, any symmetric product, and I've written some spins here sometimes, of space and spin, and these are our orbitals. And you can, and this is a, a determinant, as we all know. You can do things like take linear combinations, these, or backflow correlations like this. And the beauty of this is that the determinant is n cubed operations. Fermions with pairing correlations are more efficiently described by BCS pairing wave function rather than taking linear combinations of Slater determinants. And so they look like this, typically. And I've shown, so there's a Cooper pair wave function here, phi, and it has the, uh, a pair, so this is one, two. Then you'd have three, four, five, six, whatever. And then if you anti-symmetrize this, you get the BCS wave function. So those are the ones that we will use. Don't put a constraint that S1 and S2 are determined? Uh, no, we don't. But you can. If you're singlet pairing, we do that. If you do triplet pairing, then they wouldn't be. No, but you're not going to do triplet. We have done. But you're not going to do today. Yeah, today I'm not going to do. It. You are correct, but still, but still in the in the neutron matter, we in the neutron matter we don't. It's true that the wave function that these things would be zero when that is is true, but we do the the sum over all of them, all possibilities, because the interaction flips the neutrons, so you can't identify particle one and two. What's that? No, no, it can flip two and three, for example. It can also flip one because it's a tensor interaction. I mean, you know, when you flip one and then you get an orbital angular momentum, so you can, you can flip one. Um, 
OK. So this is basically what you So for equal numbers of spin up and down fermions, the Slater determinant can be written in the BCS form, because you can always pair them up if you like. An arbitrary BCS form corresponds to a large linear combination of Slater determinants. And the nodal structure of the BCS form Slater derivatives can be quite different, as you would expect. OK, so those forms I wrote uh, are equivalent to the standard BCS form projected onto n particles. So for a bulk system of spin singlet pairs, so here I am taking ups and downs, the BCS wave function is the usual one written down by BCS. If you then particle project this, then the Cooper pair wave function is this thing, VK over UK. And then you have a cosine here and then the singlet pair. OK, so the, since this is anti-symmetric, that has to be symmetric. And that's why it's the cosine. Whoops. So in general, you would have something like this with a set of states n and n prime that are paired together with coefficients. And then this thing just becomes this, as you would, I hope, expect. So these are the various single particle states that are paired together. This is anti-symmetric, and you have those. Okay. Okay. So these pairing wave functions that we use, they're either determinants or Fafians. And the, the, this was all written down by Luye and Kowart workers here more than 20 years ago, that, the, that this anti-symmetric product of these things is a Fafian. And if you write this out, it's anti-symmetrized with the Fafian is such that every term is written just once. So for n equal 4, it's this. So this is what we would need to do in neutron matter. So the Fafian is 0 if n is odd and has n minus 1 factorial, double factorial terms otherwise. So, And this is what we do. You can construct it just like a, a determinant recursively, which is the, like the n factorial method of a determinant here. But if you then write this skew symmetric matrix down and the Fafian of this is what we call that. And just like for determinants, you can, you can re row and column reduce this. So you notice that it's skew, skew symmetric across the diagonal. So these are opposite sign. You can prove fairly easily that the determinant of this matrix is the square of the Fafian. So you can almost do, so if you don't want to think about Fafians, and you realize that if you're doing things like electronic structure and you do fixed node, that if you ignore the nodes is one way to say it. That is, you, when you cross a node, you, just, you don't throw away the walker. You just keep going. You get this fixed node result. So you, in fact, can therefore just use the determinant, take the square root, not worry about the sign. It's like taking the absolute value. And You'll get a time step error, but you could do fixed node not knowing anything about Fafians if you wanted to. We prefer to have the sign correct, so we calculate the Fafian uh, for these things. And for nuclear physics, we prefer to also get the phases correct, so we calculate those. OK, so let me just very quickly say, if you look at the Fafian, if you exchange the particles, it's like, that's like interchanging rows and, and columns. The Fafian changes sign under this, the determinant's invariant, because it's the square of the Fafian. And then we can use this to pivot the matrix for better round off. So that's what's done. In the usual determinant row reduce, you, you pivot rows. Here we have to pivot the rows and columns. And then if you add a multiple of a row to another row, and at the same time add the same multiple 
of the column to another column. You keep it in this skew symmetric form and don't change the Fafian. So this is completely analogous to row reduction from Gaussian elimination. You can then row reduce or row column reduce the skew symmetric matrix to this. And once you have this, the Fafian is just the product of those. So it's, it's completely analogous. And order n cubed equally fast as a determinant. So there's no disadvantage to using the Fafian. Oh, and then I like to show this because I get to put 1849 <laughs> here as the, as the reference. But Cayley showed that the determinant where you change just the row, but not the corresponding column, is the product of these two Fafians. And therefore, all of the determinant updates that you can do, oh, yes, yeah, all the determinant updates. So if it's not clear what this is, you start with a, with, if you imagine you have this matrix, and then you change just the top row to Bs and take the determinant of that, it turns out, you can prove it, and Kaylee did, that this is the Fafian where there's A, this, uh, this column is across here, and multiplied by the Fafian where there's just Bs here. So this says, if, since you know how to update the determinant, and if you already had this Fafian, then you can get this one. So all of the update rules that you normally have for deter slated determinants you can use here, and they're equally cheap. So let me skip that. Oh, so this is, if the skew symmetric matrix is bipartite, so that's in the sense that if aj is not equal to 0, and a prime, j prime is not equal to 0, then a, j, j prime, and j, j prime are 0. That is, it's in this form. So if I were to do this for uh, particles, what this would be is if I put all my upspin states and then all my downspin states, then you would get, this would be the up-down pieces here. So that is ups only pair with down. If you only do that, ups only pair with downs, ups never pair with ups, downs never pair with downs, then that's bipartite. And you have this form, in which case this, the Fafian of this, uh, is then just the determinant of that. And of course, and this is exactly what the central potential singlet pairing BCS wave function is. So if you are doing a electronic superconductor, you would have these guys paired. You never have these paired or these, in which case then you can write the Fafian that I have as a determinant, which is mostly was written that way without thinking of the Fafian, but I'm trying to give you the general case first. OK. And so this is the pairing wave function, and it's I've been writing it this way. Of course, often better coordinates would be the relative and center mass positions along with spin singlet and triplet amplitudes. So you could change this to relative and center mass. The standard BCS, the pairs are in a moment, are condensed into a mom, zero momentum state. So the relative, so basically you have just a relative coordinates here and no center mass piece. And the last thing I just wanted to say, you can then also write all of these as paired and unpaired. You can think of the Slater determinant as I'm pairing particles with states. And those are, since I never pair in a Slater determinant a particle with a particle or a state with a state, it's bipartite. And therefore, it's a determinant. So that you can think of this later determinant as I have a set of states and I have a set of particles. I pair them together. And this, then, is the pairing. I say that because then you can say, oh, well, I could pair particles with each other 
and some extra particles with states. And then it's in the same form. If I anti-symmetrize it, I get a Fafian or uh, determinant, depending on whether it's bipartite or not. So this is the, the general state where you can write paired contribution and then a single particle piece. If you don't have any pairs, then this is like the Slater determinant. And if you have no uh, single particle states, then you just have a BCS wave. OK, so I wanted to show some examples of, from electronic structure. Where, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. So you did a lot of work to get Fafians and, and uh, supercollections where things to work. If I just take the BCS form and do a particle hole transformation on it, uh, I guess something that looks essentially like a Slater determinant, um, wouldn't it be easier just to particle transform? If you're on. I'm not clear what you're suggesting. If I take C dagger in the UK plus UK C dagger, and I essentially transform that to minus C. If I do a particle hole transformation, I get a determinant out of that. I get something that used to look like a BCS form, and now it looks like a Slater determinant. Well, the BCS form is looks like a Slater determinant. If that's what, but maybe I'm misunderstanding. I guess all I'm asking is after a particle hole transformation on the BCS ensembles, I really get something with a, a single state of determinant. Oh, there's oh, there's the simulations are always a single canonical. particle. Yeah. He's always getting canonical yeah. for fixed particle number. That's right. So, um, yeah, so he's not doing grand canonical. I'm not doing grand I'm canonical, doing canonical, but. I'll get a single state of determinant. Think of a single chaos. Single, single chaos can be some of the products. Well, you know, a state of determinant. But after product. the particle hole transformation, no. it you, you cannot do that because no. one is correlated to the other one is not. Mm -hmm. So you cannot do that. Mm. Okay. OK, so Coulomb interaction doesn't flip spin, so we can assign, oh, you can correct my spelling, assign <laughs> spins to the particles. And so a uh, singlet, triplet, unpaired, orbital Fafian wave function would be given this way. So this, this would be uh, pairs of up, up. This is pairs of up, down. And these are unpaired orbitals. And then it's just written this way. And these are some results. So this is not a superfluid system, although you can, I mean, certainly atoms, molecules are diamagnetic in that sense. But, but this is basically. Uh, a result that shows that there are certain correlations built into these wave functions that may be useful. So this was uh, nitrogen and, and N2. And you can see Hartree-Fock here uh, with VMC. So this is a Hartree-Fock with the Jastrow uh, correlations. Add the BCS and this. You can see you only did you get a little bit here. And then you do DMC on these, though you get more, as you would expect. And so you get you know, about 95% of the correlation energy. What is exact here, salient or percolation? Estimated, you can see. So that was this, singlet, triplet, unpaired. So certain. Under certain conditions, your pairing wave function, when you minimize it, it just reduces to a half wave fog. Right? That's correct. So over here, it's not because you're doing it in the presence of a gastro, or? Not sure what you mean. Over here, you're not falling back to half wave because you have a gastro. You're even optimizing it even in the presence of a gastro. Even without the gastro, you wouldn't fall all the way back to so no, when, no, So you when do you and when do you not? Uh, it's just like having a lot of determinants, but they have particular you know, no, they're constrained. I, I, I understand no. that. But when you minimize a general wave function, uh, under certain situations, you just, uh, the minimum is actually just a single half of the problem. Yes, it could be. Oh, but this is with, with the JASTRO. That, so so. That was exactly my question. That, that's the reason why it's never falling back to half of the problem. Is 
stuff, right? That's what I believe. Yes. I don't understand. So it would not fall all the way back to work. What? If you have an interaction with someone pregnant, you're always going to have money in your pants in your pants for that. Well, but the particular. Uh, what he was saying is if I, I mean, if I started with BCS, no Jastro, it could be that the, the Hartree Fock is the minimum of those. It would be kind of strange. I agree. There are easy systems to think of that have that property, but not nitrogen molecules. What? So a dilute hydrogen gas would have that property, but not nitrogen molecules. Uh -huh. So is it wrong when it has that property? <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing here? I better go faster. Okay, so this, the idea, so here is, is something with some multiple Fafians, but, but the idea is that you can see that you can get very close to the, to a full CI on these using just a few of these, and they don't cost, they basically cost the same as a determinant. So the idea is that this can be a saving here, whether the physics is that of pairing or not. Okay, and this was some nice pictures. Again, these guys did it, I didn't, that show you the difference between the nodes. So this is the oxygen atom, and an up and down electron are put in the same position. The others are sprinkled around in these green positions. Are that the axis? XYZ. And, uh, and what you plot? You plot the, the, the amplitude of the, of the wave function as a function of the. Pay a wave function? Yes, of the. Of this is you grab, you have two particles up and down in the same position, moved everywhere. Is that, that's correct, yes, yes. Okay, so, and you can see like Slater determined it has this well-known, has divided the nodal structure up into these various regions, whereas the Fafian and the Kreck thing always have this tiling theorem that there's only two distinct plus and minus regions. That and so they've been split apart here. So you can tunnel through. And you can see this is not the same as that as you would expect since they didn't give quite the same energy. But a lot of the physics here has happened. Okay. So I wanted to move on, but since I'm, I'll move fast. So I wanted to talk just about some results that we've done on cold atoms here. So these are typically lithium-6 or potassium-40 uh, atoms in a trap. Atomic potential is short range. The scattering length can be tuned using a Feshbach resonance. And I'll be looking mostly at the unitary limit here. And at unitarity, because there's only one link scale, the energy is given by the free gas energy multiplied by this one number. And that number for us, as you will see, has been started high and has come low. I think your number started a little low and has come somewhat higher. So I think we're eventually meeting here. So this is our original calculations 10 years ago. And what we found were using a BCS wave function, we found, well, first off, Slater determinants give an energy that's 0.54 times the Fermi gas. If you, when we first did this, we got 0.44 times the Fermi gas is that number. And you see this pairing here. So there's a, you can estimate the energy gap here. And because these are diffusion Monte Carlo with fixed node, they're an upper bound. So this upper bound has been going down. Right, let me skip that. Uh, and for diffusion Monte Carlo, unless Stefano has calculated these better, it was 383 is the current diffusion Monte Carlo value. 
These are some higher order terms in the energy, which I won't discuss. And you get an excitation spectrum here, as you would expect. These were calculations uh, by Alex Gazerlis, Stefano, and Joe Carlson here. And you can see that if you, this was two particles, one heavy and one light paired together. And you can calculate the expect, excitation spectrum of these. These are calculations where you've paired the whole system, and then you've added one particle that's unpaired. And you can see the physics, if you have a light particle, you would expect that it doesn't like to have very much kinetic energy. So it's trying to get down here in the low momentum states. If you have a heavy particle, if it sits in one of a heavy particle, if, if it sits in one of the low energy states, it blocks the pairing there. And so it wants to sit out here past the Fermi energies to open up all these states for pairing. And so the physics here works out and the quantum Monte Carlo goes through as you would expect. Okay. So I wanted to move so that's diffusion Monte Carlo. Again, all done exactly in the same way. Here I want to talk about diffusion on a lattice. So now we do diffusion on a lattice. And this is the diffusion. This is with Shei Wei Zhang and uh, Stefano and Joe Carlson. Uh, this is diffusion in the space of Slater determinants is the way Shi Wei likes to think of this. But what, you, I mean, what it means is that our walkers are a set of orbitals. So at each lattice point, there's an amplitude. So you have an amplitude at each lattice point, and you have the, for one orbital, and then for n particles, you have n of these objects. So in that sense, it's exactly like these spinners, except instead of a two state for each particle, there's the number of lattice sites for each particle. So each particle has an amplitude to being on each of the lattice sites. That's our, our, our walker. And then when we do the split up of this, of course, this Hamiltonian that I talk about here is just an attractive on-site interaction between the up and down spins. But it then can be written in a hopping term. And then this, it can be written this way. as, And what this does then is then when we linearize this, when you operate on this orbital, it just takes you to a new orbital. So it's, it's completely done exactly like in diffusion Monte Carlo. And then important sampling done the same way. And the BCS wave function is done exactly the same way. So once you know what the walkers are, you just have this phi, and it's given by the two orbital amplitudes, which you can then calculate. So everything goes through exactly the same way. So with attractive interactions, the upspin determinant and the downspin determinants are always identical, so there's no Fermi on site. So the beauty of this is that uh, there's no sign problem. I like to think of this, rather than a lattice calculation, I prefer to think of it as I've just got a continuum uh, in the simulation cell. And then I've truncated a plane wave basis in the simulation cell. Then once you've done that, since you're band limited, you can do a discrete Fourier transform on that and represent it by a set of discrete points. So if the, in chemistry, this is the, the standard way that many integrals are, are done. And you get these discrete variable bases like John Light has worked with. So a way to think about this is that you've truncated a plane wave basis in chemistry, they'll truncate a, a atomic orbital basis. They then find a set of integration points for those that will do the integration in this band limited uh, set. And then you can think of that as their lattice. 
I prefer to think of the lattice that way. That is, there isn't a real lattice here. They're just the integration points and weights. But of course, it's all equivalent, so you can think about it any way you want. And then we use this BCS wave function to sample the random walk. Same mathematics as before. OK. Now, the kinetic energy for the particle is the usual EK for momentum h bar k. And to get the correct continual limit, it must go to the standard p squared over 2m for wavelengths much larger than the lattice spacing. So if you take uh, an, uh, on s uh, next nearest neighbor, or nearest neighbor, I should say, nearest neighbor hopping, then you get the usual attractive Hubbard model. And then Dean here has calculated these on an 8-cube lattice in the grand canonical ensemble. We use this BCS guiding function in diffusion Monte Carlo. So instead of doing a finite temperature grand canonical calculation, we're using diffusion Monte Carlo. You then lose the, all the temperature dependence and things like that, but you gain by the fact that you can use a trial function. Actually, my calculation was not uh, finite temperature. It wasn't? I was. Oh, OK. So. By using the BCS guiding function, we've, we get a hundredfold speed up compared to a Slater determinant. OK, so, and this speed grows exponentially for larger systems. You mean from reduction in radius? Yes, absolutely. OK, so this speed grows exponentially for larger systems. Of course, lots of other things grow in the worst way exponentially. So. So our largest simulations have 27 cubed uh, lattice points. And we used up to 66 particles. 66 particles is what we found in the diffusion Monte Carlo to be a good number to have essentially no size dependence for these at the unitary limit. OK, so this is our Hamiltonian. And we use three kinetic energies. So this is the Hubbard. So this is the nearest neighbor hopping. If you Fourier transform it, you get this. This was the standard h bar squared k squared over 2m. And we truncate this on our basis. So it stops at whatever the maximum k vectors we picked. And then we added this k to the fourth term onto this in order, because if you look here, the Hubbard model, when you take that, in order to get unitarity, the attraction has this value. And you can calculate the effective range, and you find it's negative, interestingly enough. For the standard h bar squared k squared over 2m, the, you need a more attractive uh, on-site interaction, and the effective range is positive. And so we put this in is just a method to soften the interaction at high momentum, because this one's very soft at high momentum. So this softens it at high momentum, and then we can adjust this beta here to this value and get zero effective range, which seemed like a good idea at the time. So here's the results. You can see here's the Hubbard model results. So this is the lattice size getting bigger. So this is the Hubbard model. There's the p squared over 2m. And then this is the extra p to the fourth term that's added on. You can see it is flatter. So we'd hoped it would be a bit flatter than that. but. And they more or less extrapolate into this range. This one has a smaller variance, so it does extrapolate better. And so it has just, the smaller variance for the same effort? Yeah. I mean, the, var the, the variance of these points is not, but the fit across to there 
because of the extrapolations, because it's flatter. There was less. So the resulting variance at the end here. So this is our results for that. Yeah. So Kevin, do you remember if, if you reproduced my numbers for n equals 14 and n equals 10? I believe we did. I believe we did. At least within air bars. I just, I, I mean, uh, and using the same number of particles. That yeah, you yeah. In, in the OK, so uh, what do I got? I got five minutes. So I just wanted to say a little bit of it. It's, you know, it's, it's the Institute for Nuclear Theory. We should do a little nuclear theory. So we have the argon family of potentials. And the only thing I really wanted to say here is it has a central potential, a sigma dot sigma potential I'll be, that uh, can tell the difference between singlet and triplet states. It has a tensor p potential, so this can flip the spins and give you angular momentum. Uh, and it has a spin orbit. And in fact, we uh, ignore these in our well, in fact, the, everything beyond here for neutron matter is ignored uh, in the propagation in all the quantum Monte Carlo calculations of diffusion GFMC. And then these, for light nuclei, are put in perturbatively. There's some other, uh, the rest of the operators are put in perturbatively. How do you do that? Uh, well, I mean, it's done as. GFMC, we've done a little bit with the auxiliary field, but you, what you do is you do um, a variational calculation and a, and a, and a, and a diffusion calculation and calculate the, the mixed average in the diffusion and the variational and then extrapolate. The, the problem is Okay, so it's 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 there. There's a you know there's a whole lot of ways, but this is done done in the in the most approximate ugliest way. I mean, it's the same way that when people calculate in the most proximate ugly way any operator that's not uh, uh, that doesn't uh, commute with the uh, Hamilton. Yes, okay. it means first order. So, but you can have an insertion in this path. What's that? Oh, you can have an insertion in the perturbation along the path. You can do, we, you certainly, so the calculations that are, do, you said, how are these done? Mm -hmm. People certainly do perturbation theory where they add additional weights to the walkers according to uh, perturbing potential, and they can calculate first, second, third, fourth, whatever order by keeping these weights. There's variance problems for a long time, but all that can be done has been done. Okay. But that's not what is done in GFMC okay. in light nuclei. I mean, what they, they calculate this. So it's a variational calculation, and you calculate and then they calculate this. Oh, mixed. And then it's twice mixed minus, if I've done this, proximate is done, assuming I've done that correctly. But where's the perturbation theory? Well, it's like, it's, what, first order perturbation theory would have been, for large T, this would have been first order perturbation theory. Correct, yeah. Okay, so what has happened is, People do this, in, and it's called forward walking in the Fusion Monte Carlo. That is, you, you do your standard walk, you operate with the operator, and then you walk some more. But there are variance problems with that. So, it, but it can work very well, depending on how 
it's done. It can be done with path integrals, and it is done, and then there's no problem. So there's various ways, but what is done in this GFMC auxiliary field, because of the difficulty of the forward walking, is this thing is calculated. So this is your standard diffusion. This part is then not, not there. So that makes a mistake that, uh, that's linear in the OK, so let me, let me skip that. So this is the Hamiltonian kinetic energy, sum over pairs of a two-body potential, such as argon. We include three-body potential in neutron matter because it has the same form and is straightforward. And I just wanted to show you this to try to end on time. So these are the neutron energy gap calculations. We, these are at very low densities. Nuclear matter density is five times bigger than this, roughly. So these are low density. What we found, found when we started doing this, this is BCS, this black line. The auxiliary field diffusion Monte Carlo and correlated basis function calculations give numbers up here. Another Monte Carlo was this one done by Alex Gazerlis and I forget who else is on. Are you on that, Joe? Joe? OK. Uh, uh, on the, and they get something that's almost within our air bars. Their calculation, though, is is doesn't use spin dependent in the interaction, so it's we think less believable in this region. But that's the sort of thing, and you can see there's a energy gap here is then about two MeV, which is substantial. When you when you uh, get the energy and the difference, are you, is it actually three different simulations when you subtract the energy? So three, so that that has a lot of noise. Don't do that. That's. That's this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, that's fundamentally that, yes. OK. So I have, I just wanted to say this, partly because I would like people to solve this problem for me. So, so if you wanted to do triplets of quarks, for example, or if you wanted to do alpha particle clustering, you would like to have wave functions that could do this. And if you do these in the, write these in the standard, you know, if you just say, here's an alpha. So if you say, I have an alpha and it has four particles, and then I have the next alpha and it has four particles, and I need to anti-symmetrize those, then this would be either a hyperdeterminant or a four-index hyperdeterminant or a hyperfafian, depending on if you if you anti-symmetrize all the variables, it's hyperfafian. If you anti-symmetrize only in the slots, the equivalent of anti-symmetrizing just the spin-ups and the spin-downs, then it's a hyperdeterminant. So what's hyperfafian? Beyond determinant. So it's, it's this. It means exactly this. If I wrote this with two indices, this would be the determinant of the matrix. You call it super. Well, Cayley called it hyperdeterminant, so that's why I use that. <laughs> I, I, I didn't invent it. I, this, says I, see, Kaylee and others. But I know no, of no polynomial method for their, so for the four index hyperdeterminant, you can evaluate it in n factorial squared n cubed operations. <laughs> so this is just if you do a direct summation over the permutations of two of the indices, and the last two then become a determinant. I'm trying to work on st stochastic methods to do this. Here is the picture of, so here's n cubed on this log scale. And here's n factorial squared n cubed, which, as you already guessed, is horrible. But if you look here, you can see that 100 100 by 100 determinant, which is easy, right, corresponds to 
five uh, alpha particles. So, and if you try to get up to six, you can see that's like a something up here. Seven hours. So this six is hard. Five is easy with this, right? And anything else is impossible. So, so doing it the straightforward way is exponentially horrible. Okay. Remember GFMC, the, Monte, the most successful Monte Carlo quantum Monte Carlo method for nuclei is also exponential. I mean, this is a fundamental problem we have in nuclear physics everywhere. We cannot write any wave functions down that are any good that aren't exponential. They're all exponential. Anyway, I'm, I'm, so I've been working on this to get this working. So you can do small ones. Let me just stop there. OK, I think. These are various people who did all the work on this. Thank you. Somebody talk. Uh, so your lattice calculations, do you use any sort of Jastrow factor with your pairing functions? There is a Jastrow factor. What's the functional factor. I can't remember. What did we use? I, I thought we didn't use any Jastrow. In the end, I think the, the, the calculations, most of them were done without a Jastrow factor. But How many particles are there? 66 for the biggest. No, no, you can add. Uh, uh, I, I, you can do whatever you want for the determinant. It's just you, you any. For example, for Slater determinant, you any. You can any symmetrize either the particles or the states, but you don't interchange particles and states, so that you never have a term where you have the first state and the second state as your two indices. You always have a state and a particle. So you're anti-symmetrizing just the particles or just the states. And if you do a BCS singlet, you're anti-symmetrizing just the up particles or just the down. I mean, they, once you anti-symmetrize one, you've done the other. So if we were to do the determinant, the equivalent is you would have a slot for P, say it's alphas, and say there was a central potential. Or say you're doing a cold atoms and you had four hyperfine states. You would have the first hyperfine state, second, third, fourth. And that would form a, a bosonic cluster. And of course, the first hyperfine state would only be anti-symmetrized with the equivalent ones. You wouldn't, you'd only interchange these two. You wouldn't interchange these two. Okay? On the other hand, if we were doing alpha particles with a argon V18 interaction, we would want to interchange. They're all identical. And we'd interchange everything. Yes? Is there any particular reason, other than this is an obvious generalization of BCS or vacuum wave functions, to use this particular four particle functional form? Imagination. Mm -hmm. Or la lack, what, lack of imagination? Yeah. Yeah, that's. Yeah, so the, I mean, for alphas, I would hope that you would get alphas and then they would condense. So it's that idea. And this would then. That's why you want a four particle function. Yeah. Don't necessarily, you're not necessarily married to that function. No, 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 no. But you would want, if, if the alphas would both condense, then you would want them to all be in the same. State. So a Bose condensed alpha particle would be of this form. And so if you want to see getting to that kind of thing, this is the object you would like. It's exponentially horrible. Yes? So if you compare the series in Monte Carlo with the diffusion Monte Carlo for the cold atom probing, how, how much better do you do an excited for argon? It's 483 to 472, is that right? No, three points. No, three. One of them, if you give you an important result, eventually. No, I know. I know the mask. No, because the auxiliary field that. Okay. Oops, I don't have it here. Here. 372 with 5. So 472 with 5. So this is the. So basically, 
This this is the exact, yeah, I mean, there's the usual particle number, lattice size, extrapolate, blah, blah, blah. But, so this is our best estimate of, of, the, of the, the one that would become exact in the large limit. What is the number from the best number from the future? 3383, I believe. Let me, let me just check. It's, Maybe a little bit. With what I remember. Oops, I'm going oh, the wrong way. On the, the last, on the yeah, wherever you like. That's what I think yeah, is too. Yeah. It's a little bit larger than that, that number yeah. actually, because it's tricky yeah. the extrapolation to the zero effective range. So later we mm. revise that number. It's a little bit larger. It's mm -hmm. maybe three. Point three eight nine with an error bar of still one. But, but it's pretty good to know the color. Yeah, yeah. Right, so. But yes. you felt the timing between the two methods. Uh, the fusion is a lot faster. Which, which one is faster? Uh, the fusion. Well, I mean, partly. I mean, when you say faster, what, what is the factor? What is the Let's see. Okay, yeah. let me give you the see the the key here is this figure. If I said to you, you, you get to do whatever size you want for this, we would want to be up here, right? So what this says is that until you get up here, these calculations use up all the computer time that you have. So, right, whereas the diffusion, you run until you get an error bar of one in that last place, you're done. Okay, because you can't do better without improving your wave function. So the answer is, if we had stopped here, then yeah. they would be, you know, equal or whatever. But the, yeah. because you want to actually get up here, they take up all the time we have. So the oscillation of the color is if I use just not the BCS wave function, but straight to the terminal. If you say, if you say, no, but you use the BCS. Yeah, BC, no, this is BCS. Well, that's in principle. This is in principle. The way it tries for 14 particles. So it started from the BCS, you got a number. And then it started from a truncated BCS, so truncated the case phase. And then you got a, I mean, a slower convergence, but at the end, the same number. And then you tried with the normal plane wave. And then it took forever, but he, he got to the right point. But for 14 particles yes. and a small lattice. I mean, you have to be, you know, it's the usual thing with Monte Carlo. If, you, if you're getting into that regime, you've got to be very careful to have enough walkers, to have big enough system, and all this kind of stuff so you don't get systematic errors that kill you. But if you want to do finite temperature, you cannot use this kind of BCS wave function. You have to commit to the zero temperature. I mean, if, if we want to do it tomorrow, yes, you're correct. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't want to say that you cannot find a density matrix of this form that you could that you could evaluate. And also when you do the Hubbard Kotonovich, you know, another way to do it is to decompose it so the one body Hamiltonian, you know, is A dagger A dot plus A A, so it has the BCS form. Yes. Uh, and, oh. then, and then automatically you preserve the BCS wave function and just decompose it. So I mean the only thing what I remember in nuclear physics is it's easier to sign for the <coughs> Yes, it's. I believe that is true. Unless you can show that there's, you know, two things that propagate the same, then you would. So if you had, if for example, there was like time reverse states that propagated the same, then you can maybe get rid of the the sign problem. But I just don't know. Yeah, I, I, I understand what you're saying. I mean, that is possible that there is some, you know, that to use that form is, that would just be, that would be changing our walkers into a different form, into these, um, well.